Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of The New Nation. I'm your host, Mike. And of course, I didn't want to at first. I really didn't want to. But I guess I am compelled to make a video about Pope Francis and what he actually said about all roads, quote unquote, leading to God or being pathways to God. I didn't want to make this video because medieval grind set, who really cares? We pray for the Pope regardless if he says something good, if he says something bad, if he's speaking ex cathedra, or if he's just speaking plainly to an audience of eight year old Singaporeans or however old they are, youth group of interfaith children. We pray for the Pope and uh, everybody and his mother is making a video about this. And I said to myself, oh, do I have to make a video about this? I guess I do. I guess I have to give my perspective on this and the, maybe some of the perspectives of other people. But before we do that, guys, make sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell to get notified when I make and release new videos. That would be a, a little bit of a help to me and to the organization of the new nation. Thank you very much. So let's get into it. So the first thing that I wanted to do, I don't want to... Uh, read or give give sort of any, um, uh, I guess, uh, annotated version or Cliff's Notes version of what he said or what the translation was. I'm actually going to read what he said, okay? And this comes directly from uh, the Vatican website and from the Holy See itself. And this is the actual transcript. I'm going to read the whole transcript. It's only two and a half pages worth, or maybe two full pages if you get rid of all, like the titles and stuff like that. So, this is from the Holy See. I'll, I'll copy and paste the uh, pages into the video here. The apostolic journey of His Holiness Pope Francis to Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Timor, Leste, and Singapore. And this was uh, between the 2nd and 3rd of September in 2024. And um, this came from an interreligious meeting with young people, the address of His Holiness to the Catholic Junior College in Singapore on Friday the 13th of September 2024. Let's start. Thank you very much for your words. Three things that you said struck me, armchair critics, comfort zone, and technology, the duty to use it, but also the risks involved. This is the speech that I had prepared, but now I will speak spontaneously. And we all have to remember, the Pope's 87 years old. Okay, I think he's seven years older than Biden, and clearly, clearly more lucid than Biden, a little bit more clear than Biden. But sometimes, older people say things that are a little confusing, has to do with their age, they don't maybe speak to Claris, but let's see if what he says, you know, um, makes sense or if he seems a little senile. I, I don't want to put that label onto his holiness, but let's keep reading. Young people are courageous and like to seek the truth, but they have to be careful not to become what you refer to as quote unquote armchair critics with endless words. A young person must be critical thinker and is not good never to be critical. But you must be constructive in criticism because there is a destructive criticism which only makes a lot of complaints but does not offer a new way forward. I ask all young people, each of you, are you critical thinkers? Do you have the courage to criticize, but also the courage to let others criticize you? Because if you criticize, then someone else will criticize you. This is sincere dialogue between young people. Young people must have the courage to build, to move forward, and to go out of their comfort zones. A young person who chooses always to spend his or her time in quote-unquote comfort is a, is a young person who becomes fat. Not fatter in body, but fatter in mind. This is why I say to young people, quote, take risks, go out, do not be afraid. Fear is a dicta uh, dic dictatorial attitude that paralyzes you. It is true that young people often make mistakes, many mistakes, and it would be good if each of us, if each of you, could think about how many times you have made mistakes. We make mistakes because we started walking and we make mistakes on the journey. This is normal. The important thing to realize is that you've made mistakes. Let us see who can answer my question. What is worse, making a mistake because I started to walk or not making a mistake because I stayed at home? Everyone, the latter. A young person who does not take risks, who is afraid of making mistakes, is already old. Do you understand this? You have also talked about the media. Today, there are so many options, so many possibilities for using the media, cell phone, or television. I would like to ask you, is it good to use media or is it not good? Let us think about this. What is a young person who does not use media like? He or she is closed. What about people who live totally enslaved to the media? What are they like? They are lost. All young people should use the media, but in a matter that can help us move forward, not in a way that can enslave us. Understood? Do you agree or disagree? 
One of the things that has impressed me most about the young people here is your capacity for interfaith dialogue. This is very important because if you start arguing, quote, my religion is more important than yours, or, quote, mine is the true one, yours is not true, where does this lead? Somebody answer. A young person answers, destruction. That is correct. All religions are paths to God. I will use an analogy. There are like different languages that express the divine, but God is for everyone, and therefore we are all God's children. Quote, but my God is more important than yours. Is this true? There is only one God, and religions are like languages, paths to reach God. Some Sikh, some Muslim, some Hindu, some Christian. Understood? Yet, interfaith dialogue among young people takes courage. The age of youth is the age of courage, but you can misuse this courage to do things that will not help you. Instead, you should have courage to move forward and to dialogue. And one thing that helps a lot with dialogue is respect. I will tell you one thing. I don't know if it happens here in this city, but in other cities it happens that among young people something bad occurs. Bullying. I ask you, who is the bravest to tell me what they think about bullying? Some young people respond, thank you. Everyone has provided a definition of bullying with a different aspect. Whether it is verbal or physical bullying, it is always an aggression. Always. Just think about what happens in schools or children's groups. Bullying targets those who are weaker. For example, a disabled boy or girl. Instead, we saw here this beautiful dance with disabled children. Each one of us has our own abilities and limitations. Do we all have abilities? They answer yes. Do we all have some limitations? They answer yes. Even the Pope? Yes. All. All. As we have our limitations, we must respect the, dis the disabilities of others. Do you agree? This is important. Why I say this, or why do I say this? Because overcoming these things helps in your interfaith dialogue, since it is built upon respect for others. This is very important. Any further questions? No? I want to thank you and repeat what Raj told us, to do everything we can so as to maintain a courageous attitude and promote a space where young people can go in dialogue. This is because your dialogue is one that creates a path and that leads the way forward. If you dialogue as young people, you will also dialogue as adults. You will dialogue as citizens and as politicians. I would like to tell you something about history. With every dictatorship in history, the first thing it does is to cut off dialogue. I thank you for these questions, and I am glad to meet you young people, to meet these brave, almost shameless ones. You are good. My wish is that all of you young people will go forward with hope and not go backwards. Take risks. Otherwise, you will grow fatter. God bless you and pray for me. I do for you. And now in silence, let us pray for each other in silence. May God bless all of us in the future when you are no longer young, but you are elderly and grandparents. Teach all of these things to your children. God bless you and pray for me. Don't forget, but pray for, not against. And that's it. Now, obviously, I understand, I understand the criticisms of this. He's a pluralist. He's saying that all religions are good, or he's saying that all religions uh, arrive at the same conclusion. And I, I don't think that's what he's saying. I think we have to remember here a couple of things. We have to remember that the Pope is speaking ex cathedra. He's not speaking here in a sort of ecclesiastical, um, um, doctrinal sort of position. I think he's speaking to a bunch of young lay people who are of all are of different faiths, and he's maybe trying to, I don't know, give all of them some sort of hope. You know, of course, I understand he's speaking as a representative, as the representative of the Catholic faith. So I understand a lot of Catholics are upset with the fact that he didn't just, he, why didn't he just say Jesus Christ is the truth and that all pathways lead to Jesus Christ? I don't know. I don't know why he didn't say that. I don't even wish he would have said that because it's not up to me what the Pope says. The Pope is going to say what he's going to say. And if he doubles down on it, fine. If he corrects it, fine. But what's important to see is the media misrepresentation of it or the online misrepresentation of it. Of course, all the Protestants say, see, you know, this is your guy. He's confusing. He's never, he's never said anything concrete. Then you have the ortho bros who are like, see, this is why orthodoxy is true. The Pope is just spouting heresy. And I'm of the mind, and I'm thinking, well, if the Pope isn't speaking authoritatively here, specifically, if he's not speaking ecclesiastically, then do I have to, you know, do, do, do I have to put stock, put my faith into everything that he's saying? No, I don't think so. But I don't think he's saying anything controversial here. And there, there are a couple of reasons why I think this, okay? Let's... 
Let's look at something that C.S. Lewis was told by friends Hugo Dyson and J.R.R. Tolkien. We know that both of them are Catholics, especially Tolkien. They explained to him on a long walk how Christianity is essentially, quote, the true myth. What Dyson and Tolkien showed me was this, that if I met the idea of sacrifice in a pagan story, I didn't mind it at all. Again, if I met the idea of, of a god sacrificing himself to himself, I liked it very much and was mysteriously moved by it. Again, that idea of dying and reviving God similarly moved me, provided I met it anywhere except in the Gospels. The reason was that in pagan stories, I was prepared to feel the myth as profound and suggestive of meanings beyond my grasp, even though I could not say in cold prose what it meant. And that's from C.S. Lewis in a letter to Arthur Greaves in 1931. Now, G.K. Chesterton also kind of got after the same point. He said, quote, Paganism is an attempt to reach the divine reality through the imagination alone. And here's what Chesterton wrote. In its own field, reason does not restrain it at all. It is vital to the view of all history that reason is something separate from religion, even in the most rational of these civilizations. It is only as an afterthought when such cults are decadent or on the defensive that a few Neoplatonists or a few Brahmins are found trying to rationalize them, and even then only by trying to allegorize them. But in reality, the rivers of mythology and philosophy run parallel and do not mingle till they meet in the sea of Christendom. Hmm. So I think there's, there's, there's wisdom right? There, there's wisdom here. And Pope Francis was giving a talk off the cuff and in a foreign language to a diverse crowd of mostly non-Christian adolescents with presumably non-existent theological training. So I think we should all cut him some slack. But let's also look at scripture. This is from Acts 17, 26 to 27. And I saw it in response to a criticism of what the Pope said, and that he's just reiterating uh, you know, this, this Bible verse. So we'll start at, um, let's see, we'll start at 24 and we'll go to 28. This is Acts 17. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all men life and breath and everything. And he made from one every nation of men to live on all the face of the earth, having determined a lot of periods and the boundaries of their habitation, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel after him and find him. Yet he is not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Now we can also go to the Catechism. The Catechism tells us, the Catholic Church recognizes in other religions that search among shadows and images for the God who is unknown yet near since he gives life and breath and all things and wants all people to be saved. That's from uh, paragraph 843. To say it another way, all the document on the church and in the Second Vatican Council points out, quote, the church considers all goodness and truth found in these religions as a preparation for the gospel. It's from Lumen Gentium 16. But we can also say, on the other hand, that the Catechism states that other religions, quote, are deceived by the evil one, have become vain in their reasonings, and have exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and served the creature rather than the creator. That's from the following paragraph in the Catechism 844. The remedy, according to the Catechism, is that the Catholic Church, it explains further, God, quote, the Father willed to call the whole of humanity together in his son's church. The church is a place where humanity must rediscover its unity and salvation. She is that bark which in the full sail of the Lord's cross by the breath of the Holy Spirit navigates safely in this world. That's from the Catechism 845. Hmm? Yes. So this, this wasn't going to be a long video, but I just wanted to, I know that if I ask, what do you guys think in the comments? You guys think, are, are mostly going to think, or at least I think that a lot of you guys are going to say, Pope was wrong here. All paths from all religions do not lead to God, because there's only one God, right? That God is Jesus Christ, the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, right? So I understand that way of thinking, you know, does Hinduism lead to God alone? Alone, does Hinduism lead to God? No. Does, uh, not Sikhism, is Sikhism the same as Hinduism? I don't think so. Um, you know, is Islam, is Buddhism, is Taoism, is... You know, whatever other religion, Judaism, are those all paths to God? Are those all paths to Christ? And I think it's not a definitive no. And it's not a definitive yes. 
I think it all depends on that person's journey on those paths. Because we, we, cannot, we cannot dictate the path that someone takes to Christ. We can start them on the right path, right? We can say to you, listen, all you need to do is seek out Christ. All you need to do is become a Catholic. Go to Mass. Participate in the representation of the sacrifice of Christ. Participate in the sacraments. Start them on that path. And that path leads to glory. But we aren't prescribed to control others' free will, right? People have free will. Like me, I started on the path of, (laughs) from my beginnings of my religious journey in life from a very young age, I started with Lutheranism. And then I became a Catholic. And then I left Catholicism to just be agnostic about things. And then I returned back to Catholicism. Did I take one path? I don't think so. What about the... What about the person who was born and raised a Hindu his whole life and who converted? The same with a Muslim, the same with a a Buddhist who became Christian. Now, we're not saying that all people who start out in these religions find Christ. But I think what the Pope is talking about is in in his wanting a dialogue between young people, that the young Christians speak charitably two children of other faiths without bullying, without intimidation or whatever. And maybe they can lead some other child onto the path toward Christ. And I understand he's older. He's, he's not wanting to disappoint children. I could think of another time where Pope Francis answered the question of a young Italian boy whose father, um, whose father died, right? I think that the, Father, um, the father died, but he wasn't baptized, but the child was baptized and the father had wanted the child to be baptized. And the child asked the Pope, is my father in heaven? Poco tempo fa è mancato, viene a, a, è venuto a mancare mio papà. E lui era ateo, ma ci ha fatto battesare a tutti e quattro figli. E era un uomo bravo. È in cielo papà? Che bello che un figlio dica di suo papà era bravo. Voi pensate che Dio sarebbe capace di lasciarlo lontano da te? Pensate quello? Ma forte, con coraggio. Dio abbandona i suoi figli? Dio abbandona i suoi figli quando sono bravi? Ecco, Emanuele, questa è la risposta. Dio sicuramente era fiero del tuo papà, perché è più facile, essendo credente, battesare i figli che essendo non credente, battesare. E sicuramente a Dio questo è piaciuto tanto. Parla con tuo papà, prega tuo papà. Grazie, Emanuele, per il tuo coraggio. And the Pope had a very, very difficult proposition in front of him where he can tell one of two truths. I don't know. And that would have been acceptable to some extent. Or he could have said, no, if your father's not baptized, he's not going to be in heaven. But what he did was, and he was speaking again, not in a um, authoritative position, not in a magisterial position, not in an ecclesiastical position, he said to the boy, how could God not love your father? Someone who had his children baptized, why would God want to be separate from a man like that? So he told his, he told this young child, he doesn't think his father isn't in heaven. He doesn't think his father is in hell. 
But he's asking the child, do you think God still loves your father? Especially if he had you and your brothers and sisters baptized. That's the thing. Death happens. Death cuts our life short. Who knows the path that this father was on, right? This father could have easily been baptized into the church. At the time, he wasn't. And instead of giving this absolute answer that the Pope probably doesn't even know, he went to an answer of comfort. He comforted this child. And I think that's probably more important than giving him some sort of ecclesiastical answer, right? I think so, at least. So I think when the Pope is speaking to a group of young children, especially, you know, young interfaith children, is his job to, you know, not bully or intimidate them, but is his job really to intellectually spar with them about, uh, 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 about the finality of all roads leading to Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ is the one true God? I don't know. I don't know if children are ready for that yet. I think if maybe this was a group of older people, he could have done that. To some degree, with some, at least, a little bit of charity there. But this is an example of, I think, people going nuts for no good reason. Like I said before, everybody and their mother is making a video about this. And, um, yeah, medieval grind set. We listen to what the Pope says. We pray for him. We go to Mass on Sunday, and that's really all that we can do. You're not, going to get, you're not going to get any closer to heaven by disparaging the Pope. You're not going to get any closer to heaven by saying, oh, I wish we had a different Pope. You know, I, I just don't think it helps. And that's the end of the video. That's it. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, see you guys next week.